Right, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome today's speaker, uh, Adina Luikenmeyer from University of Ottawa. Uh, Adina completed her undergrad at Jacobs University in Bremen and her PhD at Rogers uh, in New Jersey. And then she was a postdoc at Argon and then she started her own group lab in Ottawa where she is now associate professor and chair of the department. And she leads a group um, that uh, integrates scanning probe microscopy and fabrication of custom materials and metal devices. And when they aim to advance the knowledge in physical phenomena that emerge as a result of low dimensionality, surfaces and interfaces and proximity between different states of matter. It's great to have you here, Dina. Welcome and floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I know there are a lot of synergies with with, uh, with folks here at Polytechnique and Montreal, and I'm, I haven't had a chance to visit yet, so I'm actually quite excited to be here. Uh, and yeah, as a, so thank you for the kind introduction. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa, and I'll tell you a little bit today about what we do in my lab. <clears throat> So we focus on three different areas of research. Uh, the first one is using scanning probe microscopy, so primarily scanning penalty microscopy and spectroscopy to study properties of materials. And in particular, we're interested these days primarily in 2D materials and their heterostructures. And there are two topics that we focused on um, that I will talk about today. So one of them is trying to understand the nature of atomic scale defects in these materials. And another one has to do with trying to create heterostructures um, that leads to formation of moiré patterns. Uh, and we try and understand how those moiré patterns affect the properties of these bilayers. Uh, and please, please ask me questions or interrupt me. Um, I know some of these things can be maybe too, um, if, I'm, if I'm too technical, so let me know. And uh, the second part uh, of, of our effort has to do with trying to use 2D materials and make circuits out of them. So this has been an endeavor that I've started um, almost shortly after I arrived in Ottawa in 2016. And I sort of paired up with these uh, um, you know, experts at the National Research Council in Ottawa that know a lot about how to make transport, electrical transport measurements of quantum confined system. Their, their past histories in you know, um, standard semiconducting quantum wells, in semiconducting heterostructures, uh, but then we join forces in trying to use 2D semiconductors and so as a platform for creating quantum confined systems. Um, so I want to show you a little bit as, as time allows, I want to show you how far we've got in this uh, endeavor and where we want to take it. And lastly, um, I don't think I have time to talk about it, but I know, actually, I have a, a new grant with, uh, with one of your colleagues, Delphine, at the University of Moral, that will continue a little bit of this, so maybe it would have been wise of me to talk more about it. But I'll just tell you what this is about. I won't probably have time to talk about it more in, in the seminar by itself. I'm happy to talk about it later. So this project um, has been going on for a couple of years, and it started kind of... Uh, uh, with, a, with a project with the Defense Canada where they were interested to use new type of sensing of, of uh, hazardous, hazardous gases. And so we try, you know, uh, it's obvious if you think about it, we understand the surface science of 2D materials, we understand how to make devices out of 2D materials, and so we were quite uh, intrigued by the idea of making very sensitive chemical sensors based on graphene transistors, uh, as well as uh, find ways to make them selective. And, uh, and actually, uh, this one just got published this week. Uh, the, it's, it's an idea that we go from these very, uh, very sensitive graphene transistors to arrays of them. And that is a way to make them very selective. I think that's a cool area of research. Again, I don't have time to talk about it, but of this entire body of work that we've, uh, that we've done in the last few years, I think that's a very exciting uh, point, to try and make arrays of functionalized graphene transistors for selective sense. All right, so this is what we do, this is who we are. And uh, I'm gonna start to, to tell you a little bit of one by one uh, of these uh, things. So let me start with our scanning probe microscopy. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I assume there are a lot of students here, so I'm gonna start a little pedagogical and try and explain to you what this technique is and what it does and why it's important for what we do. So this is how it looks in the lab. This is a ultra high vacuum, low temperature scanning only microscope. Uh, and the premise of this technique is that you have a metallic tip that rasters across a metallic sample and you collect tunneling card. 
Uh, so that's a that's a physical quantity you measure. And this tunnel in current has information about the density of states of the sample, the density of states, electronic states in the tip, and a matrix element that has to do with the junction, the work function of the tip and the sample, and also the geometry of it. Typically, we consider this to be uh, constant. So as a result of these two ingredients, uh, then we're, we're sensitive to two different things about a sample. This is what we learned in this technique. One of them is we learned about the topography of the sample. Basically, the tunneling, quantum mechanical tunneling current is exponentially dependent on the tip sample distance. Therefore, you can keep it constant and sort of go up and down to follow the contour of the sample. That will give you a topographic map. And second of all, which is quite a powerful technique, in addition to just you know, the morphology of it, uh, is if you look at the derivative of the styling current with respect to the bias voltage, that quantity is proportional to the local density of states of the sample. So to give you an idea of what this is, in your you know, quantum mechanics class, you learn that you put a particle in a well and you get these discrete states, quantized states. And then you can calculate for each of the wave functions corresponding to the state, a probability density for that particular state. And it would look something like this in real space, right? Very likely for the electron to be here, not so likely here. You go to the second state, and so on and so forth. Well, with the STM, you have access to exactly this information. You have access to the real space distribution of the probability density of your wave function. As you can imagine, that's pretty powerful because that can tell you things about um, that can tell you things about you know the symmetry of the system, the distribution of the wave function, and so on and so forth. In addition to just you know, obviously the discrete quantum levels of your system. So this is what we measure with the scanning telling microscope. So let me tell you first about a project where uh, we looked at the defects in 2D materials. So I don't need to tell you here probably that defects in semiconductors are the basis of a lot of electronics, right? So they're very important. Now in 2D materials, that's obviously the case as well, but think about the, 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 the following distinction. Here you have only an atomic thin layer of material, so the screening is much reduced. So whatever effect these defects have in their electron electrostatic environment is just much stronger because the material is very thin. In addition, we know from experiments that uh, you know, defects can affect the optical properties of materials, the electronic properties of materials, the analytic properties of material. Uh, and there's also these exciting new avenues where we're thinking about using the quantum <laughs> atomic defects as potentially quantum emitters. And so obviously before we start doing any of that very uh, exciting uh, you know, path, we have to understand what they are. It's not trivial to look at a material, find a defect and ask yourself the question, what is the nature of this defect? You need a technique that can have spatial resolution down to atomic scale, but can have also some kind of chemical sensitivity or, or something like that. Otherwise, how would you know? So techniques of choice to look at the nature of defects in materials are things like transmission electron microscopy or scanning probe microscopy. Scanning probe microscopy is what I'll show you. Um, all of them have you know, certain limitations. Transmission electron microscopy, the TMs have the limitation that they tend to have very energetic electrons bombarding the sample. And then it's hard to distinguish which of those defects are intrinsic to the material, which of them have I created by looking at them. And so we've used scanning telling microscopy and I'll show you uh, how we go about it. It's not obvious how would you use an STM to find the chemical nature of a particular. Okay, so the, the, the semiconductor we've used is rhenium disulfide. Um, it's a little bit of an odd choice unless you have patients and you see later down the top where we chose this material, but for now just take it as a boring semiconductor in the class of layered 2D semiconductors. It looks something as shown here, where in addition to being anisotropic out of plane, obviously these things are layered, it's also anisotropic in plane in the sense that the rhenium atoms for this chain, this unit cell is kind of diamond of rhenium atoms, and it has a quasi 1D structure in plane. Okay, so using scanning telling microscopy and uh, a topographic image would look as shown here, these symmetry reflect the fact that this is an 1D. Uh, and isotropy in plane, you can zoom in and you can see the atoms in this material. Um, you can compare them with, uh, with simulation. So we worked on these projects with uh, two group of theorists, uh, with uh, Francois Peters in Belgium and with Pavel, my colleague at Q Ottawa. And uh, from you know, comparing them to the simulated SDM images, we understand the atoms that we see. We believe we see mostly the rhenium atoms in this lattice that I'm showing here. Um, and as we 
compare that with the, with the theory. All right. So just a little bit kind of standard. What you do is when you have this material. So first you look at the, you know, first you look at the atomic structure. Okay, you understand what you see. Then you go ahead and use spectroscopy and look at the density of states. This is the semiconductor. So in a measurement where we take the derivative of the tunneling current with respect to the bias voltage, we're able to see the valence band, the gap corresponding to the semiconducting gap and the conduction band. With the spatial resolution of the SDM, we're able to follow that across an entire, you know, flake of a sample, if you will. It's the size of a, almost a device, 500 nanometers. Uh, and then we can compare the electronic gap of a semiconductor with the one uh, from the DFT calculations and sort of matches. But what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the Fermi level in this device is, uh, you know, instead of being kind of somewhere in the middle, it's a little bit towards the conduction band. So there's no surprise that when we do scanning telling microscopy and on these type of samples, we see a lot of defects. Okay, so these are those atomic scale defects. And so the student diligently kind of counted the different type of defects and based on the, just their qualitative appearance in the SDM images and found that the majority of them were this type A, so it's sort of dark with a bright, dark yellow with a bright uh, spot in, in the center. And so we decided that we're going to try and figure out what is the nature of these very common defects in this particular transition metal dichloride patch. So how to do that? So again, we don't have chemical sensitivity. This is, this is what we can do in some sense. And so we're going to go by two things. One of them is we're going to compare that with the characteristic local density of states that was calculated by uh, density functional theory. And also we're going to look for the absence or the presence of localized states that are characteristic to that defect. So based on these two, we're gonna try and infer what is the chemical nature. And so you go with this problem to a theorist and they'll give you an educated guess. The educated guess is that the lowest formation energy for a defect is if you take away a calcogen out of a transition metal like alcogenide. So a sulfur vacancy, that's what they did here. And they showed us that this is how it should look in your SDM images if you take away a sulfur vacancy. Most importantly, they said, in addition to that, you really should have a state somewhere close to the conduction band in the, in the gap that corresponds to that sulfur vacancy. But that's not what we saw. So the, the image, you know, both in the SDM image and the density of states map, it didn't look uh, like just one dark uh, image. And most importantly, uh, you know, whether we were on a defect or off a defect, we were not able to see any uh, particular state in the gap. And then we go back and then we take the second educated guess, which they said it was, uh, well, an oxygen would have a very easy time catching on to that sulfur vacancy. And so let's see what happens then. So if an oxygen has now substituted that sulfur, it would look, it would start to look similar to what we see in experiment. And also it would not have uh, you know, any, any state in the gap. And so we conclude from that, that very likely the most common type of defect in the system is an oxygen that have bound to a sulfur vacancy in a transition metal like alcogenic. These results that we obtained here have also been, um, you know, uh, um, uh, they they constitute more and more evidence that others support as well. So there are two very beautiful uh, you know experiments from there's a group in Berkeley that has the ability to also do optical mic microscopy on these uh, and, and scan telling microscopy on these defects. Uh, they've worked on the tungsten diselenide and MOS2, and they conclude similarly that oxygen um, substituting a salt salt for vacancy is actually a very common defect. So that's just our contribution to understanding. Uh, what are those type of defects that we see them, uh, their effect in fault transport or optics or, or whatnot. Um, okay, so, so we would, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, like to not only just identify their nature, let's say we have a good grip on that, but we would also like to start creating them at will, uh, deterministically, we have some ideas how to do that. And then we would also like to um, contact them individually um, and sort of try and, and, and treat them as a device by itself. Um, and I will tell you a little bit which context um, uh, we would like to do that. Hopefully we, we, can, uh, we can start working on that soon. Okay, any questions before I move along to the topic of more materials? Yep. You presented the, the <laughs> constitutive bank gap version of the third, mm -hmm. and I consider the conduction band is pretty important for this shift. While the fact is that if the phase we have changing position, 
Um, that probably has to do with some of those defects. Some of, not the one that I showed you because that one doesn't seem to do that, but it likely has to do with defects. So they would be playing with that. Yeah. And also- All over the place. Yes. You can actually, yeah, I'll show you. It kind of, it's all, it comes back around with this project as I'll show you in a bit. Uh, you can even start to understand the, the their density and their, you know, their spatial distribution. But, um, but what I want to draw your attention to that map as well, and maybe if you forgive me for flipping too much through the slides, I'll go back to that particular map you're saying here. Um, this is a 500 nanometer, right? And then probably one of these cans is maybe 10 nanometer. It's pretty coarse, right? Um, so, you know, maybe this is also just some something very macroscopically dramatic on the sample. So in some sense, this is a very, this is a very large scale. Um, Right. So if I wanted to really follow what happens across the defect, this is more the type of measurement uh, that's kind of like here, right? Like you go on a small, like this type of measurement. But yes, it's, I think in a, in a material that has a lot of defects, um, that's not shocking. But yeah, these materials are not perfect. And actually, it is important that we learn how to make them uh, good. And what does it mean good? There are two things that means good important for different kind of people. One of them is large grain size. And another one is, uh, regardless of the grain size, uh, defect free, right? These are two different things. They're important for different reasons. And people have started to work on this. So uh, I'll, I'll get back to it a little bit later. Okay, well, I'll move on then. So 2D materials, um, as maybe some of you here know, work on them. Uh, we often talk about it as well. I have these 2D materials, layer materials, I can make stacks out of them. We often say they're like, hey, they're Legos. But really, we're missing out on certain aspects of it that I'll, as I'll show you play a very important role. Um, and we should rather think of them as like, you know, deck of cards, if you will. Why? Because the sliding and the um, the sliding and the and the rotation between the layers is very, very important. Uh, and, and that's kind of the message of this slide. So a very generic phenomena um, is the idea of the Moiré pattern, right? So if you have two lattices that are on top of each other, if they are rotated by a small layer, by a small angle, you get this superposition. So you see this everywhere in nature. You see this when you take a picture. You see this in you know the chairs, office chairs, and grids on the window. It's a very generic phenomenon, not not unlike beats you study in electrical engineering. So in the context of 2D materials, if you have a layer of 2D material overposed on another with a small twist, you get this interference pattern. It's big picture thinking, the electronic properties of the material depend on the type of atoms that you have and the periodicity of your lattice. Now I've got another periodicity in my lattice. Something must happen, right? So you can kind of imagine that your electronic band structure might change. Similarly, if you have two layers of 2D materials, but now they're just lattice mismatch, they're not necessarily rotated, but they're lattice mismatch, you again get a more pattern that will change the properties. Then I get this entire family of 2D materials. <laughs> you can twist them. Some of them are lattice mismatch. This entire zoo out there of materials that we don't understand their properties because this new periodicity that arises from the more pattern will change that. Okay, so that's the that's the business work, that's the game. So let me show you a little bit about what captured the attention of the condensed matter physicists. So if you go to the March meeting, if you go to you know this condensed matter physicist venues, this is the talk of the town. So let me tell you what. So, okay, you have this, this 2D material. Oh, actually, coincidentally, my PhD work from back way when identified that the electronic properties of this twisted layer is different than one individual layer. But at the time, that was cute, okay. But later on, it was discovered that if you can go to certain angles, the band structure changes so that these very flat electronic bands appear. What do I mean by that? The electrons that populate these bands, if the kinetic energy is so small, or rather the bandwidth is so small, or if the band is so flat, the electron you know, are dominated by, by their Coulomb energy, by their electron-electron interaction. So the material property in that regime is given primarily by the Coulomb interactions between the 
few electrons. And what does that mean? That means, you know, whatever condensed matter produces get super excited about superconductivity, charge density wave, and as you'll see, the entire Ashcroft and Mervyn book, right? So, so, but what's the catch here? So when you have two layers of 2D material, two layers of graphene on top of each other, they have this band structure with cones at the, at the corners of the brilliant zone, you rotate two of them. And then as a result of that, the two cones hybridize, they give rise to this band. For particular angles, this band gets very flat. And you can show that for certain angles, that's, they're called magic angles. If you follow the literature, they're called magic angle graphene. They call them magic because they are the only angles in which this pool of energy dominates over the band width. That's where we have a hope to have created now a system that was made out of two graphene semi-metals and now could be a semi superconductor, could be a charge density wave and so on and so forth, things you would never associate graphene with. All right. Um, so actually what is interesting is that this is a very generic phenomenon. So graphene has cones, transition metal dichalcogenides have these parabola-like at the corners of the brilliant zone. Turns out when you twist them, this thing happens too, and you get flat bands as well. It's more complicated, but you get flat bands. What's really nice here is that these flat bands actually satisfy the condition of the pool of energy being larger than the bandwidth for a much wider range of angles. So in principle, is a much larger probability to create correlated electronic states in twisted transition metal dipole projects. And so that got our attention, so we started working on it. And I'll tell you also one thing that's important, back to this idea that you can create a more pattern by either twisting or by mismatching the lattice. You have that freedom here. Here's just graphene, right? It's just, it's just uh, given by twist. But here you have TMDs that have slightly different lattice mismatch, right? Slightly different lattice um, parameters. So you can have what we call the heterobilayer or a homobilayer. It's the jargon in the field. Heterobilayers means Tungsten diselenide on top of MOS2 or two different materials. Homo bilayer means the same material on top of each other, but twist. If you, it's an important point here. So if you look at how the angle of the more how the how the more pattern varies as a function of twist angle, you'll find that for the heterobilayers, it doesn't vary as much by changing the angle. Whereas for the homo bilayer, it changes a lot. What does that mean? That means that if you're an experimentalist and you make a micron size sample, you're gonna have some, some angle disorder in it. So you probably want to work with a heterobilayer sample, which is why you'll find that in the literature is a lot of work that was done on the heterobilayers to begin with, much less so on the homobilayer. So if you're a smart experimentalist, you start with a heterobilayer because you know that over a large area, your angle disorder will not influence the macroscopic properties. So we study the homobilayers. Um, and also to give you a sense of how crazy this field is and why it captures the attention of the condensed matter physicists is that within two, three years, these are the phenomena reported in materials that before, you know, 2019, if you will, were never associated with such phenomena. So superconductivity, ferromagnetism, quantum anomalous poly effect, charge ordering states, all kinds of, and the black ones represent phenomena that are observed by several groups in these particular twisted systems. The red ones are those that are reported by uh, one, two groups, so they're not reported, uh, but, but nevertheless, they were in, in uh, different city materials, okay? Just an entire field of, of research that has opened up. So let me tell you two things we've done uh, in our group within this uh, field of twisting, uh, this business of twisting. Uh, I don't have it here, but for a light comment, I'll tell you there is a uh, Monty Python uh, skit um, that goes on to describe the meeting of the society of putting things on top of other things. And if you're in this business of 2D materials, it's, you know, it's absurdly delightful. So uh, they, they keep talking. So we, are, we too have put things on top of other things. <laughs> and I will tell you today, we have worked on tungsten disulfide primarily. And let me draw your attention to, to one fact. So if you take a bulk tungsten disulfide and you want to isolate a bilayer out of it, it turns out that the angle between those two layers is 60 degrees. Okay, that's just what it is if you take it from a bomb. So in this first part of the talk, I'll tell you what happens if you take two layers and you try and force them to be close to zero. You just twist them a little bit off zero. Something actually pretty crazy happens. And I'll show you that uh, ferroelectric domains will appear and then we can control them with a scanning telling microscope. In the second part of the talk, 
we will take two layers and we'll bring them close to what they are happy to be usually at 60 degrees, but they will be twisted a little bit. So we will see a more pattern and we will see the influence of that more pattern on the electronic problem. Okay, so let's let's start with the one close to zero. So again, the jargon in the field is we call that marginally twisted. All right, this is a sample, it's pretty hard to make. So this is a, a monolayer of tungsten disulfide on top of another monolayer of tungsten disulfide twisted by 0 0.23 degrees uh, on top of graphite on top of coal. And, uh, you know, we were going after more A patterns, of course, a little bit naive. And then when we started scanning, we realized, oh, right, these are pretty regular and beautiful. It's 500 nanometers, 500 nanometers, huge, right? not atomic scale. Uh, what is it? And so what we've learned that these are, this is a nice, you know, uh, zoom into those triangles. Uh, what we've learned that those are, are the following. So the bright, there's bright areas and dark areas. So the bright areas are regions where the tungsten disulfide is stacked in such a way that the sulfurs in the top layer are on top of the uh, tungsten in the bottom layer. The dark regions are such that, you know, the, the, the metal is on top of the collagen. You can think of this as you have two layers, two sheets of paper, and then to the left and to the right of these lines, they are just flipped, okay? And then in the middle, there's obviously some very funky partial dislocation, highly strained region. And then there are these vertices, there are, a topological quantity. So once you've defined the angle of the system, you have pinned down these sites. And um, it's, kind of, it's, it's like a more pattern in itself. Okay, but this is the origin of, of, of this. Uh, but why does it happen? Why does the material do that? So it turns out that if you calculate the energetically favorable position for this configuration of zero degrees, we call that parallel, versus 60 degrees, we call that anti-parallel, you'll find that for the TMD, um, I'm calling the red curve, so for zero degrees, parallel, the AB and the BA stacking are equally happy. So these, you know, collagen on top of metal, metal on top of collagen are equally happy. And so what the material will do, it will spontaneously, once you twist it and you've defined those Points, it will spontaneously break into these beautiful triangular, equilateral triangle uh, triangles to just be happy, right? Uh, and so the anti-parallel is a little more complex. It's got some kind of a hexagons. I won't talk about it. We haven't measured that. Um, but that's the reason why it creates those, uh, those paraelectric. I mean, I said paraelectric, I'm getting ahead of myself. Turns out that not only is this, you know, structural reconstruction going on, but also there is a charge transfer from one layer onto another uh, in such a way that you will get this, this theoretical paper. This is very new stuff, by the way, like the, the, the recognition of this phenomena, it's only, it goes as far as like 20, 20 or something. So, so uh, the, the, you know, there's a, a understanding that there's a polarization uh, as a result of the spontaneous interlayer charge transfer that points in a certain way in one of the domains and points in the opposite way in the other domains. So essentially you have like a network of these plaquettes that are paraelectric. It's pretty cool. So let me tell you a little bit about two different types of um, regions. The ones that look like shown here, very beautifully symmetric, and the ones that are a little bit asymmetric. So let's focus on the symmetric ones first. So we're doing STM, right? So I, I kind of showed a little bit of that introductory slide also for the purpose of, of, uh, of emphasizing the work here. So you apply a bias between your tip and your sample. So you're establishing an electric field between the tip and the sample. In the interest of time, I won't worry with this, but if you do a console simulation of this tip, you will find that even though at the very apex is very sharp because you need to see atoms, Overall, this is a, you know, this creates a very uniform field between the tip and the sample. So now I've got ferroelectric domains. And this can be like a, a homework, right, if you will. I have ferroelectric domains, and then uh, with polarization vertical that points up and down, and I apply perpendicular electric field that can be up or down, depending on how I switch the polarity on this bias voltage. 
I'm obviously going to make some of those domains more energetically favorable because because their electric polarization is aligned with the electric field that I'm applying. The others are going to be pretty unhappy. So what's going to happen? The happy ones are going to try to expand, but that's going to curb that funky, you know, partial uh, dislocation. This energy that goes to that. So there's an energy balance between how much these domains can grow at the expense of curving the partial dis uh, uh, dislocation. So that's what we see. So if you apply a very negative bias voltage, you're essentially favoring these dark domains at the expense of the bright domains. If you're applying a very positive bias voltage, it's the same region as you know, kindly pointed out by these defects. These defects are everywhere. They're like a, you know, the um, you know character that appears in every one of our stories. So uh, you know, you you can recognize, you can use them as marker, and you can see that it's actually the same exact region. You can play this game over and over. You can expand them. You can contract them. So you might think that these bright, dark white lines are just guide to the eye. Um, they're actually not. So when we saw these uh, these paraelectric domains, I've seen a paper that was uh, you know showing transmission electron microscopy and piezo force electro uh, microscopy from the University of Manchester. And I contacted Volodia there, who's a theorist. Um, and so I told him, you know, I know you you have a model about these domain walls. But do you think it's going to hold true for different length scales for different electric fields and so on? And so we tested, and uh, I think it's the first time that I've surprised the theorists with how how good their model was. Uh, but it turns out that this very simple model that kind of has the ingredients that I described earlier, which is this elastic energy, uh, you know, the 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 energy you gain by increasing the size of the domain, you lose by curving the domain wall, captured in this model. And so essentially, this model has two parameters, one that has to do with the bonds themselves, and so omega omega field that are like the parameters that have to constant like sulfide itself, and another parameter that has to do with the displacement field, and so, and, and, the, and the length, right? So if I do this for many different, uh, you know, uh, uh, many different length of these triangular domains turns out it's actually pretty consistent one to another. So all those all those uh, white lines are essentially a, at some point a parameter free if you will. Once you found it for some of them, you can just. And so now let's see what happens in this area. Why are these perfectly triangular and these are more elongated? So before I explain why, let me show you what happens there. So. Um, They've, uh, so, so Volodia, the two Volodias, um, they've, uh, they've adapted their model to also include the fact that if you have an, an uh, isosceles triangle, if you apply a sufficient electric field, you're actually going to merge those two domains into two domain walls to the point that you're actually going to mostly switch the material from being polarized one way to being polarized another way. This is what happens. When you apply a negative bias voltage, we actually switch most of it to be kind of polarized this dark region, and then we have merging of the domains. And then the same region, when we apply a positive bias voltage, we actually switch it the other way. So you can never switch the entire material from being you know, up to being down. But what you can do is you can make most of it to be up or most of it to be down. Those, those you know, vertices are pinned by the twist thing. It's very, um, it's very different. And if any of you are experts in kind of more standard electric, I'm very interested to talk to you because I think there are very important differences that perhaps we don't, you know, appreciate as much, or, or maybe it's a reference from that community don't appreciate as much. Um, so, you know, so anyway, this is just to show you that this, the, 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 the model, the idea that you have this merging of the two domains holds true. Uh, and now, why did these domains happen? Why are they elongated in some areas and not so elongated in a different area? That has to do with strain. So if you play with this type of lattices or you play with you know, like the, the system that can create more eye pattern, you notice that the tiniest strain in one of them completely distorts the more eye pattern, right? It's like a, you can think of the more eye pattern as a magnifying glass for, for, uh, for any strain you have in the material. That's what happens here. You have just a tiny bit of strain in your material, and that will completely elongate these triangles. That's what happens. You can back out the strain. Forgive me for calling it strain map. Like, I don't know, there are different kinds of strain, but that's just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the, of the sort of uh, things in this area. You can, 
you can calculate in, in, the, in the paper if you're curious, you can look at the different type of, uh, of uh, details there. Yeah. And this is more complicated. I don't know much about it, but I'll show you just because it's cool. Um, the, the electronics of it, right? So what happens is a band structure, right? So we got a gap, it's a semiconductor, it's got a gap. Turns out if you look at this electronic, uh, the, the, the uh, wave function, so this is local density of states map. So this is the map of the electronic wave functions at these particular energies on the valence bands. As you can see, there are states that follow that geometry, but um, what exactly this means, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. I think it's quite complex and interesting, but um, I don't have much to, to share with you other than the show you. Okay, so let me move along to, so this is what happened when I had tungsten disulfide and I twisted just off zero. So it's completely different regime, right? It's ferroelectric reconstruction of the mass. But now what happens if I twisted close to, to 60? And then as I, 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 as I promised you, if you have a homobilayer and you twist it, your periodicity changes a lot by angle. And this is what we see in, a, in, a, in this type of sample. This is actually uh, is an archive now. Um, and so for just such a small change of angle, we actually see quite a change in the moiré pattern of, of, the, of the sample, right? So as you can notice here. But we focus on one area that's shown here, uh, where this is a moiré pattern that we found in a twisted tungsten disulfide just off 60 degrees. In fact, turns out this is a 57 degrees approximately. So the moiré pattern is six nanometers. This is 20 nanometers uh, long, right? And uh, if, if we zoom in, we can identify the high symmetry stacking point. So this is the, uh, they're just labels that correspond to different ways that the atoms stack in this moiré pattern. This is a theoretical calculation. So for this work, we've uh, we've worked with uh, with a group from UCL in London. So in uh, Johannes, I, I was at a conference and I saw he had calculated this. And when we had the data, we kind of went and compared. So what they told us though is they said, listen, when you have this moiré pattern, what you're actually going to also create is you're going to create a relaxation of the lattice. So there's going to be some out of plane relaxation that comes along with this moiré. Cool. I told them, okay, well, I can't see that because I can't distinguish the electronic information from, you know, from the, uh, from this very tiny corrugation out of plane. I'll believe you. But then what happened is we went ahead and measured the electronic properties with the SDM. And what we found in this very 1990s black and white graphs um, is that, you know, instead of just the, the, the band gap, we have these two features. And one of them, if we compare to their theoretical calculation of the band structure, corresponds to essentially a flat band. It's a consequence of a flat band. So it is true. If you twist these angles just off zero, there is a flat band that you create. And, um, and then we can look at, this is a average over the entire moiré, but then we look closer and we try and look at the difference between the different high symmetry points. So where is this state corresponding to a flat band distributed in space? This is the power of the STM, right? You can actually see those things. And for the longest time, we were extremely puzzled because it was just inverted compared to the theory. And, and you know, you go through all the different areas, uh, but it turns out that uh, it's very insightful and, and the, the postdoc working on the theory here went ahead and calculated and he said, what if I just start playing with this relaxation? We take it for granted, but you're not measuring things in vacuum, right? You have things on a substrate. Could it be that, you know, you actually have a difference in this outer plane relaxation? What difference does that make for the material itself? What you found in these calculations is that the flat band is still there. At the same energy, you're not messing with the flat band, you're not messing with the energy of the flat band. What you're messing with is the distribution of the wave function corresponding to the flat band. So, in fact, the fact that we saw this you know, weight of the flat band difference from one to another basically told us that our samples have a much different relaxation degree than uh than what uh than what we assume for granted from, from the experiments. I think that's very important to know. Uh, and also very, very hard to find out in other ways than scanning probes. And, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the story here about the more we, we're What we want to do, as you might imagine, is we would like to make these samples uh, to have a, a, a gate, an electrostatic gate, and we would like to be able to go to these flat bands and be able to 
uh, populate them with a very well defined carrier concentration. And that would allow us to create the conditions for superconductivity and all the other, um, you know, correlated insulators and other uh, strongly correlated phenomena, right? Because th that's where you create this condition of having just the right number of electrons in that band. So for that, that's what our PhD student has been working on these two projects is, is working on before he um, sets free after his So, all right. I don't know if I have time to tell you this, but I will just tell you as a fun fact that you can also have at some point we wonder, do you only get more red patterns if you have the same lattice, the same symmetry lattice, either mismatch or rotated? And then we found out that if you take graph in a renewed disulfide, these are different symmetry lattice, or we call them mixed symmetry more. Right? And uh, and actually, long story short, sorry for flipping through, um, we actually can get more red pattern. Uh, so you can get you can access different type of symmetry for Moray patterns by just playing with the symmetry of your parent physics. That's just to convince you that we have a Moray pattern. And you can also calculate. Um, so here we work with a different set of theorists that had also calculated this type of uh, big symmetry patterns. And uh, they told us that in this particular case, we had the graphene and the rhenium disulfide, uh, you know, rotated with respect to each other by some uh, 12 degrees depth. Gave us a five nanometer sort of stripey like that. Okay, that's very cool. That actually opens the possibilities. It's a very nice review um, where they actually go ahead and explain an entire family of more patterns um, that you can create using PV material, largely unexplored. I mean, what I've showed you today and what the field is at is like just a tiny data point here. Uh, but you can go ahead and explore magnetic materials, charge density wave materials, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. You can, uh, you know, you can take 1D materials and another 1D material and you square lattices. And so what this paper is trying to sell is the idea that you can think of these as a, uh, as a quantum simulator. And so there have been quite some progress in simulating copper models using twisted TMT, this beautiful work from approving Cornell. They sort of pioneered that idea. And, and, uh, and so in principle, this can be a platform. That's what this paper kind of explains very well for quantum simulation using more impacts. Okay, in, in which sense quantum simulation, I should explain in this type of audience, the idea that you can, so since you have a very complicated material, what are we condensed matter physics is good for? We make a model for that complicated material and try and hope that it's going to explain it, right? So let's say you can you have you make a model, but then you can't even solve that model numerically. Sometimes you have you know analytically, uh, and so like Hopper model in, in two D, and and so what you do is you create a material system or some kind of system. Not, I shouldn't say material. You create a system that simulates that simple model. You try and solve that simple model by measuring the system you created to model it, and then hope that with that solution, you can go back and, and explain the complicated one. So that, that's the premise of quantum simulation. And there are many kinds of platforms, uh, as we were discussing earlier too. And so the point here is that this could be a platform as well. <coughs> All right, let me show you in much fewer details the work that we've done here. Um, and I'll take the questions at the end, just in the interest of time. So here, we're trying to quantum confine structures. And uh, this is a top project. Why is this top project? Because it's really hard to make good ohmic electrical contact between a 1D semiconductor and contacts. Why, another reason why this is super hard is because it's really hard to make a pretty thin interface where you can apply a uniform electric field on that length scale. This is really hard. So it took us two years to do it, uh, to, to you know get recipes for making the device. But I'm happy to share with you the three results that we obtained so far and kind of where we're going with after we uh, sort of work through that. So to the credit of the, of the graduate student now postdoc that you know really uh, stuck to it and really worked. So we, we looked at tungsten by cell and night in this case, uh, so the structure. And what's special in these semiconductors is that if you look at the spin and the valley degrees of freedom, they're sort of, there's a, they're, in, they're interconnected. So they're, we call it spin valley locking. So at different valleys, let's say it's a spin up, spin down, and this valley is down up. So the spin and the valley degrees of freedom are related to each other somehow, we call lock. 
So why is that good? That's good because if you're thinking of making spin qubits out of this, this semiconductor is not crazy to think about that. People are making qubits out of semiconductors, right? Quantum dot semiconductors. Um, in this case, first of all, you have fewer nuclei because the material is thin. Second of all, it's much harder to decohere spin because it's related to the to the valley. But it's also you can argue back. You can say, well, that also means you can control it much harder. So, but but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to first of all, the first order, understand how can we break this degeneracy in a in a quantum confined tungsten diselenite system, uh, if you will, and if you're generous enough, you can maybe see how this thing goes towards making sort of quantum circuits. So there are three results that we have so far. One of them we've demonstrated that we can uh, create a gated quantum dot in the system. We have made a, uh, a quantum point contact like structure. So this, I should say, really, uh, this is just uh, me and Louis working together for the last maybe six years on this. And his lab at the NRC has phenomenal transport experiments and we sort of share students back and forth between New Ottawa and NRC. And I'm very grateful for this collaboration. Um, so in this one, we created kind of a, a, a quantum point contact like thing or nanoconstriction where by measuring the current uh, through it, we can sense whether there is a charge nearby or not. And what we're really passionate about these days is trying to understand transport in 1D in this uh, atomically thin semiconductor. It's not easy to understand which of the degrees of freedom we will break, uh, which degeneracy we will break. And we found some very weird uh, you know, puzzling things. Not just us, but others in the field as well. I think this is a very important question. Okay, um, so, oh yeah, this is, this is the hard work. This is uninteresting, but really hard work. So, so we use an AFM uh, as a way to clean our devices. So after every layer we create in these devices, we use vacuum annealing, we use um, forming gas annealing, and we use an AFM tip to like individually broom every single layer. And these samples can get very, <laughs> very crazy. So let's convince you that we have all these contacts. We have very low contact resistance, and this was, years. Okay. So this is how the devices look like. Lots of work. Bottom gates, gate dielectric contacts, material, top dielectric, top gate, and then in many different iterations, the top gate can look very differently. The bottom gate can look differently. We have also graphite as a back gate in some of them, all kinds of tricks. Won't go into the top by itself. Um, but this is supposed to impress you. So this is a Coulomb blockade in this device. It's supposed to tell you they created a quantum dot. What's uh, left to do is to also be able to control the number of electrons in this quantum dots. Right now, I can only show you that I can have you know, a situation where I can jump from one level to another, uh, but I cannot really tell you uh, very much about how many electrons there are. I can go from N to N plus one. Okay. Um, we can estimate the size of those dots. Oh, by the way, these dots are those defects which you saw. And if you're trying to do any quantum gate quantum dot experiment, you ought to start with the material where the defect density is much, uh, you know, they're much less dense than your, you know, quantum confinement region. So that's not the case right now for the type of materials that you can find. So we, we're playing tricks how to get around that. But just a word of warning that those, de those, those defects actually uh, play a huge role. All right, uh, charge detection, very similarly, kind of a cute idea. As you see, we, we've played the top beat in various configurations. So if you have this type of uh, uh, device where you have a source and a drain and you have two gates, and now you're applying voltage to the gates. So you're applying increasingly more voltage to the gate and you're measuring current across, at some point you're gonna pinch off the channel, right? So it's open and you're making the channel smaller at some point you're closing it. So your curve is like it's open and at some point it's closed. But what if you have a uh, quantum dot nearby? As you're trying to activate those gates, at some point you're gonna populate your dot with an electron. And then all of a sudden you can have a little more way to pass current, so you're gonna see kind of a peak. Right, so this is a kind of a standard way to see it's, it's a charge detector. People have made these uh, in, in other platforms as well. Um, but if you're trying to, you know, make these circuits and you're trying to 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 have ways to not just make quantum dots but really detect the charge in those quantum dots, then you ought to also be working on making charge detectors. So what we made here, um, this is published actually already, um, and uh, and this is kind of to compare it with others as well. All right. 
Lastly, we made a 1D channel. The Landauer formula tells us that the conductance in a 1D channel is proportional to E squared over H times the number of channels and times the degeneracy, right? Spin and valley are locked. Degeneracy is two. You could think it's four, right? Two per spin, two per valley, but spin and valley are locked. So this is two. So if you're a student going to the lab and like making your experiments, you're really excited, then you expect to see two E squared over H. So this is really great, right? But I'm not telling you that this is a paper that is not published yet, it's in progress, because for the longest time, both us and others in the field, this is going to come out uh, shortly, have only seen one is squared over h. Why one is squared over h? What breaks that degeneracy? No idea. There's no electric. So in this more controlled experiments we've done recently, uh, you know, we start from two squared over h. I'm not showing you here in the interest of time, but we can, with magnetic field, go to 1e squared over h, so we can break that degeneracy with magnetic field, we can calculate the associated g factor, but for some reason, you know, and even weirdly, we also saw hot e squared over h plateau. So this is a little puzzle in the field. Basically, the puzzle in the field is to understand breaking of the degeneracy uh, in, in these uh, 1d ch quantum confined channels in 2d materials. All right, cool. So this is where we want to go with this. So we want to <laughs> we have dreams to, to make them uh, as an array and to also be able to control them with light. Uh, so we started a project now where we also try and play with light. I don't know. We have to still work on our quantum dots before we do that, but it's pretty exciting, I think, as a direction. Uh, we haven't seen spin split yet, but we know from the 1D channel that we can split the, 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 the spin of the state. So it's pretty encouraging. Um, and uh, and yeah, okay, so so wafer scale grows. So I'm advertising this. If any of you will need two inch wafer scale 2D materials, we're working on setting up something at QI Ottawa where you can um, you can purchase it. This is very expensive. Um, but you know, this is in the spirit of trying to um, you know trying to grow materials of higher quality. And there's a group that has made a lot of progress in Columbia University in using flux method to grow bulk crystals that have a small number of defects. Uh, here, ideally, if we could do that at the model layer limit, <laughs> that would be really great. So we'll be able to grow graphene, HPN, uh, and some type of collagenite. All right, so I also want to advertise these chains coming up. So we, uh, we will start a quantum consortium on pretty much everything I talked about here today. I sort of poured my heart into that grant with everything we know to do. And so we'll be able to continue doing that, but really great. Uh, we'll be collaborating, and I, maybe some of you are online or some of you are, uh, know the people online. So in the heterostructure, we'll also, the Moira heterostructures, um, my colleague Adam and Waterloo, uh, uh, will contribute with magnetic materials. And my colleague Zillian Yen at UBC is already doing optics. Actually, Zillian, I, we ju I just visited UBC. He's doing very similar experiments on those ferroelectric domains, but using optical spectroscopy. That's pretty cool. I'm excited to continue that. Um, in terms of the gated quantum dot, obviously, we um, will be leading that. And with Peter's help at, at McGill, we hope to understand more about uh, you know, the lifetime of those states in the atomic type quantum dots, not just the, the, the gated quantum dots. Um, and, uh, and the growth, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, James Gupta is my colleague who's leading that MOCPD facility that hopefully will kind of run parallel to this. And, uh, and also, I am very excited to start working on the CREATE program that we'll have together with Polytechnic. Um, with, uh, with Stefan and Osama and, uh, and, and, and co-led with Tami, which I know is probably online. Uh, and we're very excited to kind of start thinking, we'll start in September, uh, and start thinking how we can sort of bring together these communities. I know you all had the RQMP, right? And others, but we're excited to, uh, to, to be part of it and extend it. Um, so this will be sort of Henry Keith, the theorist at Toronto, Thomas, uh, who's from the community here, an experimentalist at McGill Peter, uh, Stephanie Chizik, who's uh, really fantastic. She's a new faculty member in my department. She does uh, AI and quantum uh, as a theorist, so I really um, you know, get to know her if you don't know her. And, uh, and your colleagues, and again, Adam, uh, Andre Marie, and, uh, and Lee Goodrow. So we're excited to start that as well. 
Uh, so yeah, so this is our group and uh, Justin did all the transfer, Justin is fantastic and he's now a postdoc with us and uh, Laurent, Lina and Ryan did all the SPM work. Uh, Laurent is a PhD student, uh, Lina is a postdoc and Ryan is a graduate PhD student as well. So with that, I'll take questions. I had a question about the first part on the margin with the WS2. Uh -huh. So first, uh, what happens if you anneal the sample? Did you anneal the sample before measurement? Yes. After twisting? Yeah. And those feral electric domains remain? Right, it's a good question. So there's a there's a paper out now, we're doing journal club on it. Um, so we are interested in that. Also in the context of what is the melting temperature of this ferroelectric, electric, however you want to find that. So, the fact is, experimental fact is, is that we create these things with all the cleaning procedures we have in place, which involve thermal annealing, but they're still there. Uh, now, how exactly they evolve from one temperature to another, I think that would be interesting to look at. You can also say, how are you doing SPM is the worst possible measurement for this, right? The length scales are hundreds of nanometers. Your SPM is not sensitive to polarization. And we're working on, uh, on adapting one of our PSO course microscopy to be able to have a higher throughput of measurement in such large samples. I mean, the SPM is nice. You can show that you can control it with electric field. But if you want to do things like that, we're also interested to see what happens at the edges. Uh, so there are reports like uh, Pablo's group at, at MIT, right? They, they, they make a a uh, ferroelectric switch. They put graphene on this boronitride ferroelectric domains and they see that it has a uh, hysteresis. Uh, and, and that is not quite the picture here. So, anyway, there's a lot of questions. So, a related yeah. question What does bilayer, homo bilayer WS2 look like? Yeah. Okay. I'm with it, just homo bilayer. Uh, I have no idea. Why? Because we don't. The first thing to look at? So, um, in, in some sense, no, because in my head, that's like a boring, <laughs> you know, so if you go look at bulk, it's an easy experiment because you don't have to do, but if I have to do all of this machinery of, of, you know, exfoliation just for bilayer tanks and disulfide, I wouldn't do that. So we twisted them close to 60. Um, it's just, yeah. Well, I'm not seeing the context of this homo bilayer and what to where we see the symmetry breaking. Yeah, I think I think if there's a question to ask, I'm very happy to hear about it. But from in our mind, right, there was no a priori interesting thing that we knew of that could make us look at the bilayer. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I was mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, thanks, great. Thank you. Uh, when you had these domains that had round shapes or mm -hmm. uh, round. It reminds me of uh, particles that have a uh, phase energy, like 3D particles with the uh, phase of the shape, which reach an equilibrium between uh, the different forces. Uh, mm -hmm. that you use. Can, can you picture the shape of that as a balance between the force of the. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what it is, actually. That simple model that they use to model that is exactly is exactly that. It's an elastic model that says that much energy I gained, you know, by expanding this domain, and I expanded it by curving this domain. So in some sense, it's just a elastic model, if you will. Yeah. But the, is there a, a cost and energy of producing more interface steps? Oh, so like once those, interface? okay, so once those centers, the vertices of these are in place, that's that something dramatic has to happen to move those, like maybe some big defect or something. But as far as we can tell, I mean, in principle, it's a perfect example. Those are topological quantities, they just are pinned there. And all you can do is you can bend those domains around. Yeah. They're pinned to what? They're, they're essentially a moiré phenomena. So their density has to do with uh, the twist angle. So if you have just bilayer at zero, those don't happen. But if I were to look atomically, you know what happens at this oh, there, yeah. what atomic right. at the atomic level, what, what yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that's a good question. And and there's a beautiful TM work on that. Oh, I'm going to get you all the T now. Maybe I should go back. Oh well. Um so it's highly strained, highly strained uh partial dislocations. 
it's what they are. And we haven't been able to image them. I didn't tell you, I didn't get a chance to tell you that, uh, that all of these measurements are done at room temperature. Again, experimental reasons. Uh, these things are not conductive enough to, to, you know, in this geometry for SPM to do low temperature measurements. And so, uh, okay, I'm all there, my as well to show you. Uh, there you have it. Okay, this is atomic. In the, this is a, there's some TM work. There's a group in Berkeley that some beautiful TM work uh, of these. Actually, the group in Berkeley has managed to measure the strain very accurately at this boundary. Yeah. But STM wise, we would love to look at them. It's just at room temperature, it appears very hard to get that type of resolution in this system. So, get two dislocations that we Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it pins them. Mm -hmm. And in the center is even more dramatic, obviously, because you have a much stronger strain. Yeah. 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 Yeah, right now we're trying to work on, for example, uh, uh, memory effects, right? So uh, cycling back many times to see whether these things, how flexible they are back and forth as a result of that electric field uh, and so on. Yep. There's a question in the chat from yep. Tommy. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice talk, uh, Adina. I just want to ask one question. So you see the domains in your STM scan. Do you see them also in topography mode? Yes, this is a good question. And it relates to when I was mentioning that, that this is a, a, a bad technique to look at it. Because in the topography normally, uh, so what happens topography, you measure it's a contour of constant tunneling current, right? And normally your bias voltage is constant, but here that bias voltage is locally diminished or enhanced by the local polarization. And so in some sense, your topographic maps have a effective, if you will, height. Um, because locally your bias voltage will be either a little bit higher on some plaquettes or a little bit lower on some others. That's the origin of the contrast in the topography. Oh, I see. Really? Yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's some kind of a, if you want an effective height or a parent, a parent height, maybe rather better use. Cool. Yeah, the referee actually called us out on that. It's a very good point. So we ended up making in the supplemental, we'll have a, um, a, a very like statistics about the, the, the apparent heights that we've observed with many different tips and many different samples, just to give a sense of how how much it can vary. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, can you on the question of the quantum conductance? Can you discuss some ideas? What is the potential mechanism that breaks the degeneracy? Mm -hmm. So it could be that there is, um, you know, there is some kind of a spin broken degeneracy. I don't know the effects, some kind of magnetic defect. It's crazy, right? Uh, why the, this valley would, would break, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, there are even crazier things like uh, when you enter this regime of Wigner of, um, disposition. <laughs> It's a big, big word in the physics department, so you don't say that without. Uh, but, uh, but, but, yeah, yeah, we're looking for for ideas. So we're also interested to know whether we can estimate whether that Wigner localization regime is um, is attainable in our devices within the charge carrier concentration that we have, the site that we have. Those are, I think, very yeah, that would be a cool thing. Oh. Okay. okay, any more questions for anyone? Well, I want to thank you for the invitation, but I also want to say that I just personally want to uh, thank you in advance for accepting invitations to speak at our summer schools and uh, <laughs> another seminar series in the context of our creators. So thank you. <laughs>